Chapter 9. State and Society. The university exists through the good graces of the body politic. Its existence is dependent on political considerations. It can only live where and as the state desires. The state makes the university's existence possible and protects it. The university as a state within the state. University owes its existence to society, which desires that somewhere within its confines, pure, independent, unbiased research be carried on. Society wants a university because it feels that the pure service of truth somewhere within its orbit serves its own interests. No state intolerant of any restriction on its power for fear of the consequences of a pure search for truth will ever allow a genuine university to exist. Having exempted the university from interference by its own power, the state respects the university and protects it against all other forms of interference. The university is meant to function as the intellectual conscience of an era. It is to be a group of persons who do not have to bear responsibility for current politics, precisely because they alone bear unlimited responsibility for the development of truth. Though outside the world of practical affairs, the university as a place of research is necessarily permeated with a sense of reality. Knowledge, not action, is its link with reality. Value judgments and practical action are suspended in favor of the ideal of pure truth. A life away from the arena of practical affairs is meaningful only if sustained by a passion for learning and understanding. It is an inward form of activity, a series of triumphant acts of self-discipline. Yet the academic life, once entered upon, is ever prone to its own set of corruptions, which threaten to muddy the pure atmosphere of intellectual activity. Suspension of value judgments may degenerate into mere neutralist indifferences. Suspension of practical action into laziness. Intellectual caution into neurotic fear of any challenge to enfeebled energies. Change in the university in a changing world. Society provides the university with legal and material support so that it may function as a center carrying on basic research for the benefit of all and affording people studying for the professions an intellectual climate as well as practical training. Thus, the university is continuously serving the needs of state and society and bound to change as society and the professions change. During the Middle Ages, it had to train the clergy, later on the higher government officials, the doctors, and the teachers. Until the 17th century, Century, knowledge of God, theology, and philosophy had been the all-important subjects. Since then, however, the growing influence of technology has increasingly called for specialized training. The most recent and sociologically inevitable stage has been the admission of women to university study. Over the past 50 years, the number of occupations requiring university study has been steadily increasing. The corresponding increase in university attendance, a factor beyond the control of all concerned, has brought about a change in attitude on the part of all members of the university, and particularly in the relations between teacher and student. Steady growth of enrollment has changed the nature and function of the university imperceptibly during the period from the 19th century to the First World War, and more so ever since. To meet this new call for mass education, the university has been forced to adopt the methods and procedures of the high school. Yet society affects the whole spirit of the university not only indirectly, but directly and deliberately through political means. This type of influence has changed drastically from one historical period to the next. Unfortunately, Humboldt's advice to governments never to think of themselves as indispensable has gone unheeded except for a few rare and notable moments in the joint history of university and state. State interference has always meant favoritism for particular sets of beliefs. This has been true of monarchies and to a lesser degree also of parliamentary types of government. Under radical regimes and dictatorships, such interference tends to the point of outright violence. Influences both political and sociological transform the university, yet behind its many changing forms looms the timeless ideal of intellectual insight which is supposed to be realized here, yet which is in permanent danger of being lost. The historical conflict between this philosophical impulse and society's ever-changing demands is marked by alternate periods of fruitful cooperation, each in its own unique way, and periods in which the philosophical ideal suffers utter defeat, hence the alternation of periods of sterility with periods of vitality. One way in which the university itself can lose out is by excessive concessions to outside pressures for mass education and by lowering its standards to the high school level. 
the public influence enjoyed by the university has been similarly subject to fluctuations. The meaning of government supervision. As a corporation with official charter, the university runs itself, yet is simultaneously responsible to the state that charters and protects it. Legally, therefore, it has a dual status full of ambiguity and even tension. While the university can never become a state within a state in the full sense of the word, the converse, its degradation to the rank of a public institution bereft of all individuality, is quite conceivable. As a matter of fact, the relations between state and university are almost always tense, often marked by open conflict. The state has easily the upper hand over the university and can, in fact, destroy it. For without the state, the university is helpless. Hence, all conflict must confine itself to the intellectual plane. The initiative must come from the mind and spirit manifested by a university which must compel the public mind to clarify its thinking and discern its proper objectives. It must eschew clever political man maneuverings as not only inappropriate but fatal to its integrity. It must frankly and openly show what it stands for. It controls the state through the power of truth, not of force. The outcome of this intellectual conflict will, then, be the cooperation of state and university, not the destruction of the worker by the stronger party, always assuming, of course, that the state does want to help realize the idea of the university. If it does not, the university has no choice but to keep alive its ideal in secret, to refrain from all public activity and await the eventual fall of the present regime. Even so, the university is lost if official hostility to its ideal should persist over a long period of time. Assuming the cooperation of state and university, let us look at some concrete examples of what state supervision involves. First of all, the state will implement its concern for the independence of universities by acknowledging certain legally binding forms of that independence. The university as a corporate entity must be certain that it is independent. Thus, the professor is not primarily a civil servant, but a member of a closed corporation. The civil servant merely carries out the political decisions of higher authorities. He is duty-bound to obey, as a judge is bound to existing laws which he may only apply. His virtue consists in carrying out instructions to the letter. By contrast, the professor's essential work is of his own choosing. He is duty-bound to assume personal responsibility for his own research activity all the way from the initial problem he poses himself without any outside interference. He makes his decisions on the basis of criteria imminent to his work, which elude outside prediction, instant verification, and final judgment. The professor must, first and foremost, think of himself as a research worker and teacher, not as a member of a corporation or as a civil servant. The state merely functions as the ubiquitous overseer of the university's corporate independence. The university, in turn, freely acknowledges this function, neither secretly rejecting the underwriter of its independence as a necessary evil, nor obediently bowing to every whim of the state. It confidently accepts state supervision so long as this does not conflict with the cause of truth. Loss of this confidence spells disaster, for the state supervision may at times protect the university against acts harmful to the true ideal of the university itself. And if the state should make improper demands upon the university, the university has the duty to speak up and clearly state the intellectual principles on which it, it bases its objections. For it is this formulation of its ideal on the part of the university which enables the state to come to know, so to speak, its own mind and act accordingly. The university, in turn, achieves self-knowledge only as it achieves objectivity. The task of overseeing the university carries with it grave responsibilities for the state. Any man so charged ought, I think, be equipped above all a sense of intellectual quality and an attitude toward the intellectually creative people entrusted to his care comparable to that of a horticultural expert toward precious plants. He must subordinate all considerations to the task of discovering and cultivating the kind of intellectual vitality which can only be recognized and cultivated but cannot be made, and must be ever ready to combat all opposite tendencies. In all matters of intellectual culture, inseparable as they are from human character and personality, the overseer's great power must never be used to undermine the moral integrity of professors. There have been times when universities gained in the visible accessories of glory, such as institutes and endowments, what they lost in professional integrity. When approached with contempt, treated with disrespect, maneuvered into situations which virtually impose unethical conduct, and exposed to academic politics in the most literal sense, professors, like the rest of mankind, will eventually respond in conformity with the worst expectations. 
administrators are always tempted to place exclusive emphasis on mere externals and immediately visible results. They are tempted by the feel of power, by the craving for recognition and gratitude. Professors, on the other hand, incline to flattery and docility in order to get ahead. Ideally, discussions between administrator and professor are frank and on a high level of moral integrity. Disappointments are bound to occur frequently but the spirit of an administration is judged by its aims and expectations, not only by its instances of disappointment. In character and attitude, the overseer or trustee of a university needs a different endowment than that of a professor. He must face present realities with detachment and objectivity, yet respect individual personalities. He must, without vanity, derive satisfaction from knowing that he has contributed to the flowering of a world not of his own making, but under his care and dependent on that care. He has to try to evaluate the quality of intellectual life on behalf of which he must make financial decisions to the best of his ability. All this requires a high and sovereign detachment. In general, professors cannot fulfill this particular requirement. Working in particular fields and therefore easily partisan, they are intellectually committed to special interests and therefore are not sufficiently detached. There are exceptions, of course, but since the tasks and necessary talents of administrator and professor differ as they do, one does well not to allow former professors to act as overseers and trustees over other professors. People with legal training, administrators by training and choice, are preferable. Were professors ever to indicate that they wanted only professors in administrative posts, this would have to be strenuously opposed. At the very least, the overseer who lives in the same place as the university of which he is responsible ought never to be allowed to lecture. His work must be confined to the wholly separate sphere of administrator. The purpose of state supervision is precisely to prevent those corruptions to which a completely independent university would be exposed. Fear of outside competition and of excellence tends to turn self-administrative bodies into monopolistic cliques interested in safeguarding their own mediocrity. Inevitably, the promotion and hiring pattern will then reflect a gradual and almost imperceptible lowering of standards. The system of co-option by itself will fail to produce ever better men and will instead favor a mediocre common denominator. However, if and when political interests interfere directly with university life, then state administration becomes a threat to the university. It is incompatible with the idea of the university that the state demand any more direct services from the university than to supply professionally trained people. Hence, it is disastrous if the state demands something which only serves the purpose of political propaganda. Any state interference with teaching cannot help violating the idea of the university. This danger remains even when the state must interfere to take disciplinary action against university members abusing their position for overt political ends. The state has a direct stake in education since it wants civil servants, doctors, ministers, engineers, chemists, and the like but it must be left to the university to decide how this training is to be accomplished to get the best possible results. The state must confine itself to a purely supervisory capacity. Thus, while on continental Europe doctoral examinations must conform to state set standards, they, at the same time, are administered solely by the universities. The state cannot interfere with their intellectual content except to the extent of enforcing the standard, whose maintenance is required by the idea of the university itself. The Principle of Intellectual Aristocracy In 1930, the American Abraham Flexner wrote as follows, quote, But democracy is a social and political, not an intellectual, possibility beyond the fact that to the aristocracy of intellect every individual should be eligible on the basis of ability without regard to any other consideration whatsoever." End quote. Two problems are involved here. First, there is the principle of intellectual aristocracy itself, on which is based the hierarchical structure within the university. Secondly, there is the toleration by democratic society as a whole of that minority which this principle involves. The second problem is the one stressed by Flexner. It comes down to a problem of politics. Intellectual aristocracy is not aristocracy in the sociological sense. Everyone born into the intellectual aristocracy should be given a chance to attend the university. Their aristocracy has a freedom that is self-achieved and includes men of noble birth, workers, the rich, and the poor. But it is always rare and confined to a few. 
a minority. Majorities have always been hostile to privileged individuals and minority groups. Their hatred for the rich, for the gifted, and for a cultural tradition is always great. Most of all, however, they hate anyone basically different from themselves, anyone moved by that genuine and uncompromising will for knowledge which the great majority never experience, yet feel compelled to acknowledge as a noble challenge. The incompetent cannot rise to meet this challenge because of a deep-seated failure of will. By contrast, people with a calling for the highest will love and quietly revere those of noble mind and spirit and translate this love into increased demands upon themselves. Hence, whenever majorities are politically decisive, a dual process of selection is continuously at work. On the one hand, people instinctively reject those with an original and uncompromising intellect. Secretly, everyone agrees that great men are a public catastrophe even though officially the call is for men of caliber. What people want is men of normal ability. Men of below average ability, on the other hand, lose out just as men of outstanding talents are quietly sidetracked through the countless little acts of the, ma of the majority. How, then, explain that social groups ruled by the majority do in fact support minorities committed to the search for knowledge in their midst. The Middle Ages believed in the delegation of corporate functions so that the philosopher in contemplating God was active on behalf and in representation of the great mass of people who were fulfilling different corporate functions. The masses of our time probably no longer believe in this delegation of corporate functions. Today, they might justify the existence of science and scholarship by claiming that because science is a good thing, a belief which certainly underlies the whole popular cult of quote-unquote science, it must have an assigned place in society where it can work freely and take chances without the constant pressure for useful results. The problem remains even if society believes in this firmly enough to restrain its otherwise irresistible momentum toward assimilation and collectivization, whether this leviathan will itself agree to respect the place of scholarship and science. Will society agree to reserve a place for an understanding beyond its comprehension, yet of potential future utility? The search for truth and its relation to politics. Politics has a place at the university, not as actual struggle, but as an object of research, where, struggle, where political struggles invade the university. It is the idea of the university itself which suffers. Since the existence and external form of the university are dependent upon political decisions and goodwill, there is no room within the confines of the university, free from state interference by state consent, for political conflict and propaganda, only for the quest for truth. This means that the university requires absolute freedom of teaching. The state guarantees the university the right to carry on research and teaching uncontrolled by party politics or by any compulsion through political, philosophical, or religious ideologies. Academic freedom extends not only to research and thought, but also to teaching. For thought and research need the challenge and the communication which teaching affords and which in turn depends on the freedom of scholars and scientists the world over to speak and write as they please. The state is determined to grant groups of scholars and scientists the facilities for the kind of long-term mutual exchange which they require for a balanced view of their subjects. In the study of man's nature, mind, and history, even the most extreme intellectual possibilities are to be explored to the fullest, not only in the form of casual, random, and quickly forgotten intuitions, but in the disciplined continuity of major intellectual productions. Only thus can we preserve in ages of intellectual barbarism those elements of knowledge and culture which can again become an inspiration to broader masses of people in happier times. Academic freedom proves its value wherever there are people who have merged their personal and their intellectual existence. They become the representative minds of an epoch, when their very awareness of historical forces frees them from the obvious and trivial kinds of dependence upon their time. All men are potentially capable of meditation and reflection, but only a very few have the calling for intellectual work in all its complexity. This minority includes the members of all professions requiring university study. It is the only group which can respond intelligently and critically to the advancement of learning. Though the search for truth does not produce benefits of immediate tangible use to the public at large, the public itself wants this research to continue as a free, long-range proposition on behalf of the nation as a whole. Not every state is interested in truth to the point of granting academic freedom. No state anxious to conceal a basic criminality of principle and action can possibly want the truth. 
It is bound to be hostile to the university, pretending friendliness only the better to destroy it eventually. Academic freedom means the freedom of student and teacher to do research in their own way and teach as they see fit. As for actual subject matter, that the state leaves up to each individual. This defines the very freedom which it guarantees against all interference, including its own. Academic freedom resembles religious freedom to the extent that each of these freedoms is guaranteed not only against state interference, but is guaranteed by the state itself. Academic freedom can survive only if the scholars invoking it remain aware of its meaning. It does not mean the right to say what one pleases. Truth is much too difficult and great a task that it should be mistaken for the passionate exchange of half-truths spoken in the heat of the moment. It exists only where scholarly ends and a commitment to truth are involved. Practical objectives, educational bias, or political propaganda have no right to invoke academic freedom. Academic freedom and constitutional freedom of speech only superficially resemble one another, for it is quite conceivable that academic freedom may continue even after the constitutional freedom of speech has been abolished. Faculty members cannot invoke their constitutional freedom of speech except as private citizens. They cannot expect the university with which they are professionally affiliated to come out in their support when they speak as private citizens. They are entitled to this protection only in matters relating to professional publication, but not in connection with casual political remarks, opinions, or newspaper articles. Academic freedom does not entitle them to special privilege over other citizens. It means the professional freedom from all obligations other than intellectual thoroughness, method, and system. It does not entitle one to irresponsible pronouncements on public affairs. On the contrary, it obliges one not to cloak such casual pronouncements in a false air of authority, to be double careful about making them in the first place. There is, of course, a long-standing tradition of professorial intervention in politics. Most of it is not very glorious. Instances to the contrary are rare and atypical. The seven famous Göttingen professors dismissed in 1837 for political dissent left their posts not because they dissented politically, but because they felt unable to reconcile their religious convictions with the breaking of the oath they had taken to the Constitution. Max Weber was the only and inimitable exception to the rule. His political statements were themselves part of his intellectual achievement. Democratic contemporaries labeled them highbrow and written above the heads of his audience. As for Socrates, never once during the 27 years of war with Sparta did he take sides in the hotly debated issues of the day except after the Battle of Arginusae, when he alone among the group blocking the unconstitutional vote to execute the generals refused to sacrifice ethical principle to popular pressure and give in. With this single exception, Socrates spent his life probing his fellow citizens with questions aimed at their most basic motivations, and so made himself more disquieting to them than the worst demagogue. Where expert knowledge is involved in contemporary issues, scholars and scientists have the right to make pronouncements. They can apply their knowledge through the medium of medical, technical, and constitutional opinions. They can systematically apply their knowledge to any contemporary problem which in the eyes of the state and society appears important. The form in which they make their contribution felt is through rational argument rather than personal intervention. Their task is to restate the evidence and to provide a clear picture of the total situation. They are free to volunteer this information even though normally they ought to speak out only in reply to direct inquiry. In practice, however, every answer to contemporary problems is likely to be biased by non-objective considerations. The very questions are apt to be loaded. No critical scholar should ever forget how close he is, when faced with questions put to him by the public, to the position of the priest in Hebel's play, who is told by Holofernes to find reasons for a decision already made. Academic freedom is not a piece of property to be owned and enjoyed once and for all. The very economic dependence implicit in salaried status harbors a latent threat to the professor's moral integrity. Inevitably, professors tend to support the social conditions which favor them and give them status. To recognize the existing state of affairs and to serve the current government with their spoken and written word, the publicly appointed professor has come in for more than his due share of distrust. Ever since Schopenhauer leveled his grotesquely exaggerated charges against state-salaried philosophy professors, 
Such mistrust is justified only when it takes the form of self-criticism. It is no accident that ever since Socrates, quite a few philosophers have thought it important to remain entirely independent and refuse reimbursement in any form whatsoever. The University and the Nation Greek in origin, the idea of the university is part of the Western tradition. As a publicly endowed institution, the university belongs to the state. As a privately endowed institution, it is certainly part of a given national scene. In either case, it is the expression of a whole people. Seeking truth and the improvement of mankind, the university aims to stand for man's humanity par excellence. Humanitas is part of its very fiber, no matter how often and how deeply that term has changed its meaning. Thus, while every university is part of a nation, it has its sights set on goals above and beyond nationhood. Differences aside, in this respect at least, it is akin to the idea of the church. The university proper must not take sides in the conflict between nations, even though, as human beings, its members have each their national allegiance. Members of the university, whether faculty, deans, or the president himself, abuse their position if they should choose to hold political rallies in favor of either a particular party or the country as a whole. They serve their nation and all mankind solely through the medium of intellectual creativity. The idea of the university suffers when abused for extraneous ends. Nationalism, like everything else, forms a legitimate topic of research, but cannot provide the basic direction of the university itself. We have come to the end. Beginning with the attempt to define the nature of science and the intellectual life sustaining it, we were led to examine the university as an institution. The variety of issues which had to be raised could obscure the one all-important issue, the idea of the university which is the very lifeblood of higher education. This ideal cannot be reduced to a few simple statements, but had to be brought out indirectly. May we grow ever more aware of its real meaning, and may it serve as a standard guiding our judgment of all aspects of university life. No one who does not feel its validity can be made to see it. Since discussion is fruitless except where there is common ground, all we have done is put familiar facts in a new light. We are deeply committed to this ideal which has given meaning to our life, yet we lack the necessary strength to speak of it with the enthusiasm it deserves. We know that truth, striving all around us to be seen and recognized, will live or perish with our ability to realize the ideal of the university in its ever-changing forms. About the author, Professor Carl Jaspers is equally outstanding as an authority on philosophy, psychiatry, and literature. He is known throughout the academic world as an exponent of existentialism and as one of the greatest figures in German university life, who refused to support Hitler and continued to stand by his refusal inside Germany throughout the Nazi regime. After the defeat of Hitler, Jaspers was the one who forced German academicians to face the inescapable responsibility for their own share of guilt in bowing to Hitler. At present, he is Professor of Philosophy at the University of Basel, Switzerland. Thank you for listening to this audio recording by David McCarricker, published by Theory Underground. This work has been placed in the public domain because of its importance. I hope that you all enjoy this during your holidays in its small daily doses, like an advent calendar. And that if you are intrigued to hear lectures on the topic of the idea of the university, then I hope you will consider joining the course that I am leading with Brian Weeks and Ann Snellgrove, the three of us, all educators, interested in the idea of higher education and a kind of learning environment that cares about the freedom of individuals to be able to research what they find most interesting as opposed to what big business or political partisans think you ought to be researching. I'm going to actually show you all really quick what the website looks like. So you go to theory-underground.com. Make sure to register with the website and then go to courses right here. You can also go to events and get to it that way. And then right here you see Mikey teaches Zizek for they know not what they do. That's a class that kicks off in February. We also have professional managerial class consciousness that's kicking off at the end of January. And I'm teaching that one with Elton. And then the idea of the university right here. All three of these are courses that you can add to your shopping cart and choose to take if you want. But the idea of the university, if you click on it, if you're not already logged in, then this is what you should see. 
click take this course, click add to cart, view cart, and then proceed to checkout. Oh, one quick thing, don't forget, I guarantee the verification email will be sent to your spam folder. So if you're going, I tried to sign up with their website, I registered and everything, I just didn't never get the, I never got the email, uh, don't worry. It's in your spam folder. You just have to find it, and you might not be able to find it from your phone. You might have to actually sit down at a laptop. I'm sorry. It's not always as easy as giant mega corporations make it when you try to do stuff underground. So go for it. Try it out. Let me know if it works. Okay, bye. So anyway, that's how you do it. I hope to see you there in the discussions on the Zoom chat, but also in the forums where the real conversation will hopefully be taking place on the website. Anyway, everyone, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. Take care.